I was thinking about all these things when I wrote you down the information. So I would like you to go over the information. Okay. And then you can ask me question. I can uh, repeat whatever is written here. We can expand. So we'll not uh, take your time. You were born in Romania in 1927. I'm born in Romania in July 1927, which brings it to July 2003, 76 years. 76 years old. Ago. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your earliest memories of anti-Semitism in Romania. Well, my uh, earliest memory of uh, Jewish persecution goes back to the time when uh, I was uh, a child. Uh, short after uh, the Nazis occupied Romania, I was uh, eliminated from the school that the Lyceum that I wanted to uh, attend because Jews could not attend anymore, neither public nor private Romanian schools. And this was when, do you remember? In 1940. In 1940? Yes. So you were 13? Exactly. Okay. And you remember being in Lima? And I remember being kicked out. The same year, I remember being kicked out from my home. In one day, we were throwing out from our home and our furniture and every belonging were put on the street. Lucky enough, one of my aunt, my mother's sister, was living in a home that was owned by a Christian. So we were allowed to move there. So in one room, we were living six people. This was beginning of the war. And immediately in 1941, we witnessed probably one of the worst pogroms in uh, the history of Romania. The, there are two pogroms that are usually listed. One is the one in Bucharest, and the other one is the one in Yash. At the pogrom in Bucharest, they practically took out Jews from their homes, from their streets, from the streets, from the businesses. How did they do that? Uh, by force, putting them in trucks, taking them to the to the uh, to to a, to a slaughter home house where they killed animals and putting them on hooks they didn't have enough ammunition the rest of them were taken in a forest and it's probably one of the very renowned stories that happened during this uh, legionnaire uh, pogrom in Bucharest Romania when my friend that I was able to see after 40 years in Israel, a few years ago at a reunion, told the story. One day they came in 41 and took him from home. His two brothers and his father, they took him to the forest of Jilava. The forest father took the children in his arm and they start shooting. After a half an hour, the man realized that the two sons are dead and he's alive because the bullet, the, the children being in his arm protected him. So he survived and the children died in his arms. In his arms. Uh, the man, my friend, uh, who is now a rabbi in Israel, Rabbi uh, Grim, uh, Grim, uh, Ephraim Gutman, told, retold the stories that we know because he didn't come to school for a week or two and then when he came he told us what happened to his brother. His father that I have seen later after a few months used to have a big black beard and his beard was changed in white completely as a trauma as a result. I remember going to see if uh, we can find friends or relatives uh, if weeks after uh, the pogrom and we saw at the Institute of Forensic uh, in Bucharest. They were waiting for them to make the autopsy, and they were on the floor and on the tables, 
dead people. The synagogue, one of the most beautiful synagogues, was destroyed. They threw the Torahs on the floor. So these are vivid memories that stays with me. And that's when I was 13 years old. My father was sent to a labor camp in Hajien, where he worked for four years. I haven't seen him during the war at all. And tragically, he came back after the war alive. And uh, as he went going to, to our home, a bombardment happened. He went to, to hide in, in a basement on a hospital, thinking that they're not going to bomb the hospital. They threw two bombs. And he remained paralyzed, and after two years, he died. So uh, at least we had him for, uh, for a few years with us. You were sent to a labor camp. I was sent to a labor camp in 90, uh, uh, when I was 15 years old. And I have here a document that I keep as a memorabilia. It's my identification card to the labor camp. Can you read what's written here? The word? Evreul, which means the Jew. We were not identified as Mr. or Mrs., but as the Jew, Leonid Saharovich. And I keep it as a souvenir that stays with me for the rest of my life, because it's, uh, it's a document. Did you give this to Joseph? Any chance? To Joseph? Joseph is scanning documents in the back. I can so give it to him. He has. I can just give it to, to him. Sure have, I, I can give sure it to him. Yes. I will give it to him. What was the name of that document? Do you remember? Yes. Is it, is it a past? It's an identity. It's called Detachement de Munke, Labor Camp, at the disposition of the City Hall of the City of Bucharest. Identification so card 261. So it's your labor camp ID card. I, yeah, exactly. And you had to keep that on you. Every account. day when I come in the morning, this was a transit camp. So in the morning when we came to the appeal, to the call, we had to bring the card with us, and we were uh, making the sign that we, the Jew Saharovich Leonid, yes. We were not called Mr. or Mrs. We were, that was uh, how we were identified. It's a little. 61 was your number? Yeah. I, uh, when you say number, because many people are asking, uh, your number is not tattooed. Tattoo were only people who were in extermination camps. You were in a transit camp. In a transit camp, this was our identification card, opposite to the people in the camp. And I want to call your attention to a lady who is going to come here for, a, for the interview, especially for you for uh, Mr. Miller. Robert, Hello, if Mrs. Diamond is coming here. She's been here. We had her. Talked to her. This morning we just Ah, uh, did you, I will bring her back because she is a unique case. Her number is tattooed. Right. Did, did he show you? It's on her arm. No, but by mistake, they put a wrong number and ask her to come back to, to burn her again with the correct number. She's a very, I am going to bring her tomorrow to take this picture because it's a very unique case. Okay. Huh. Harriet, uh, Harriet Diamond. Harriet. Uh, no Harriet Diamond. Henrietta? Her, no Henrietta is, uh, what's her name? Uh, Ruthie Diamond. There's Ruth Diamond. We met her as well. Okay, good. No, let's continue. Okay. okay. Um, tell me about your time at Bucharest. My time in Bucharest, uh, I can tell you not only my time in Bucharest, my parents both came from what it's called in the history of, of the Jews, shtetl. Mm -hmm. The shtetl is a small village mm -hmm. that keeps tradition mm -hmm. and continues the Jewish life. My father was born in Tigina, Bessarabia, and my mother was born in Sadagura, Bukovina. They both belonged to Romania or forced and back to Austro-Hungary, to Russia, and so on. As a child, I used to visit these cities. And in my memories, will always stay, for instance, 
the wedding of my cousins who were outside. Traditional wedding are under the sky, winter, with a rabbi, old man being brought to the wedding to celebrate. The music, the dances, the, G the Yiddish theater. In Bucharest, we used to have uh, Bucharest Yiddish theater is a place that Goldfarn created the Yiddish theater in Europe. And to the day, we have a Yiddish theater with translation at the, for the people who do not understand Yiddish. When I went to England to visit uh, Shakespeare uh, uh, theater in the lobby, I saw a picture with a troupe, with a group from Romania, from the Yiddish theater that performed Hamlet in Yiddish. So they were a, a very rich cultural life with a lot of tradition, synagogues, beautiful synagogues, uh, people, uh, the, the, the Jewish people were uh, very active in not only in business, but in science, in art, in theater, in movies, in, in music, uh, composers, scientists. Uh, even today, the president of the remaining Jews, uh, 6,000 Jews that remained from 800,000 who used to be in Romania, 400 were killed during the Holocaust. And all these uh, people are uh, people who have brought their contribution to the development of Romania. Your job in the camp, dismantling unexploded... There were many jobs that we used to have in the camp. Cleaning? Uh, I will take it for all the seasons because it's very interesting. In summer, we used to work in a vegetable garden from morning until night and pro help producing vegetables they were, that were put. Could to be you eat them? Stealing them, we could eat them. So on this hand, I can say on that uh, we had an advantage working into a garden. But the most dangerous jobs was dismantling unexploded bombs. You know, they were bombs that were thrown out with a timer. So after a bomb was hitting the ground and did not explode, people will know that it's an uh, unexploded bomb. The, the, the task was to go and to, un, to dismantle the timer so the bomb will not explode. It was quite an, a, a dangerous job and it was reserved for Jewish young people. Uh, after a bombardment, we were called to, to clean the debris. Well, cleaning the debris, you could find dead people under the, the, and that we had to take out. It was not too pleasant for a child, 15 years old, to do such jobs, but we had to do them. And probably one of the very, very uh, dramatic, tragic work was during the winter, in, in Romania has heavy winters, we were supposed to clean the snow from the street. And I remember talking about anti-Semitism that in a winter, a lady called us to come to give us tea to warm up. And I, we appreciate the gesture very much. And uh, she gave us glasses of teas with a little bit of bread. And we were very happy. Her was that was during the war, a woman, a woman. A woman. Her husband came back and started screaming to her, what do you do such things? These are dirty Jews, they have to die. Let them freeze. How did, so she pushed him into the house and said, you finished drinking and leave. But her heart was good. And you know, in Romania, uh, Sir Martin Gilbert, that I mentioned to you, wrote a book about the righteous Gentiles. And he asked me if I can furnish him some information about righteous Gentiles from Romania. And I sent him the information about a woman who was working for the Red Cross as a volunteer. Agarich is her name, and she's very famous. Yad Vashem gave her the title of righteous Gentiles. She put herself in front of the Bless you. That means that what I say to you is true. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, she put herself in front of a train that was transporting the Jews from Yash mm -hmm. 
and uh, said, well, this train is not going to leave until we do not open the doors and we take out the, the people. And the German were scared, and the Romanian, and they let the people be freed. And so she saved so many hundreds of people. And after the war, this woman was declared righteous Gentile, and she was given at Yad Vashem the honor, and a tree was built in her honor. Let me stop you right there, because I want to ask you something. We've interviewed several survivors so far. Many of them feel, out of all of the people they had encountered, that it was the neighbors, the teachers, the doctors, the grocers, that were, as Daniel Goldhagen calls them, Hitler's willing executioners. We had one woman say that she was more betrayed by the neighbors than by the Nazis because the Nazis were animals, but these were people turned animal. When I hear stories like what you just said, do you feel like there were more righteous Gentiles than, than we can recall? Do you re Yeah, I, uh, this question, uh, I put myself this question many, many times. And uh, my answer to you is that in a forest, you have good trees and bad trees. You have to go to see the good trees and the bad trees. Evidently, the good trees were in minority during the war. If we would have had only good trees, we probably wouldn't have had six million Jews to be killed. More and more have been saved. But meantime, we have to recognize that there were good people too. Take what the people, for instance. Good? What makes what made her give you tea and her husband tell you? To that's die? a very very good question. People are different, individual one from another. This was a good woman. She was a mother of children. She saw children like her children on the street, winter, freezing. Hmm. So she felt she had to do something for these kids. She came out. She gave us what a glass of hot water. That was a tea. Her husband was probably a fanatic anti-Semite. I give you another example. But a father. But he was a father, but a, a father with a stone heart, not with a soft heart, not with a human aspect. That's why we cannot understand. For instance, my oldest uncle was killed in one of the most horrible way. The Romanian came into Tigina. They took him out from the home in front of his wife, tied his hand and his leg to a horse and a carriage, and started beating the horses and ran with him until they brought him back bone, skin, flesh, and blood. And everybody was looking to this, and nobody was protesting. My wife has another powerful story that she's going to share with you that was written on paper by one of her uncles. And you are going to see what means good people. It's a physician, a Jewish physician, saving the life of a Christian woman. And then she said to him, I have to share with you a drama. Go to the synagogue here a few miles and you will see a scene. And he went to the synagogue, opened the synagogue, and find all the Jews killed on the floor. And he took, and on the wall, and he's writing, my wife has in, in writing all this thing. On the wall, they put the swastika, made from what? From Jewish blood. They dipped their hand in Jewish blood and made a swastika on the wall. And he cut off this plaster. So, Generally speaking, I was confronted with this question many, many, many uh, times. It all depends, for instance, during the war, when the rebellion of the legionnaires came, a good friend of mine from childhood, I used to play with him, soccer and wonderful man, came and said, I would like you to come to stay with us because it's dangerous for you. I said, but I have parents, I have grandparents, I cannot leave them. 
He said, well, we don't have room for all of you. So I was his friend. For him, I was close to. So he invited me to save my life. And I have to, to, to still remember him as a good man. And there were many, many good men, but not enough, not enough to say that they could have shown more understanding for the tragedy and do more. And you are going to see a survivor here like Mrs. Halsky that you are going to interview who was saved by Poles, who kept her in the basement. So there are examples. Yes, generally speaking, they were good people, that they were in a minority. We cannot talk about general, the, the general population was supportive for what happened to, to, to the Jewish people. <clears throat> Tell me about the camp. Yeah. You told me about your jobs. Yeah. How did you do it? How well, did you get through every day? He, he, knowing that you have to survive, knowing yeah. that because it was very important, we believed, especially those who were religious, like myself, believed in God, believed that God is here, but not, <coughs> not God exterminate the Jews, the Nazis. God was a prisoner like we all were. And we had the feeling that we have to be strong and determined and do whatever they were asking us to work in dangerous places to survive. And we survived. And thank God that we survived and we would rebuild our lives and goes on. Where did you tell yourself that God was during that time? Uh, many times, many times we were asking, for instance, there were boys who had to say, you know, boys, uh, Jews remember the days of the death with saying Kaddish. And there were boys who had to say Kaddish for dears one. Now, where do you say Kaddish in a camp? Well, we, we went to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the places where they kept the horses in the stall, and uh, 10 people were sitting there, and the men could say the, the prayer. And then we were sitting and thinking, God, look, what is the Kaddish? The Kaddish is very, and people do not know the content of the, of the meaning. We praise God. And we were praising, we were continuing to praise God because we thought that not God is responsible for what happened to us, but the Nazis. There are several people who said God left them there. And it was at that moment that they abandoned all religious upbringing. In fact, there's one woman who says she's not an atheist because she'll never let him be in God. She'll yeah. never let him be absent. She well, says, I want him to know, I know he's there, and he left me. How do you, how do you explain her anger and your faith? I'm not asking you to explain her, but where does your faith come uh, my, from? My faith, my faith comes from my upbringing. I was brought up in a very observant home where uh, God was praised every moment. And this gave me, instilled in me, the confidence and the belief that God will help us survive, like he helped us in many moments of crisis. It all depends on how strong you are. You can see the same thing happened in Auschwitz, no? Thank you. Uh, in Auschwitz, you find an Elie Wiesel who grew up in a religious family, an observable family, and he, and, his, and he sees his father, his mother dying near him and still believes in God. And here you have near him in the same camp another famous Jew, Primo Levi, who questioned God. Where have you been, God? And he is right. Do you know that <coughs> at the end of the war, Jews were putting God on trial? Religious Jews asking, where were you? And the answer was, where were us? Where were we? God was there. That were the inhuman Germans, Nazis, Italian fascists, 
queens who did what to us, what happened. They were the Ukrainian, the Russian. Do not hesitate a moment to believe that this war, this, this horrible job was carried on only by the Nazis. Take Babiar. Do you think that a hand of Nazis could have exterminated tens of thousands of Jews if it wouldn't have been the help of the local people? Take 50 years later the Poles in Zhedwabne. For 50 years they have said that Jews were killed in Zhedwabne by the German. Only after 50 years they came to sense recognizing we were the one who killed the Jews. We poured the gasoline and the fire on the barn and exterminated the Jews. It takes long time to come to recognize for those who have been uh, involved in the Holocaust. But the conclusion is, and that has to stay with us, that Hitler and Mussolini could not finish the final solution without the help of many local people. Hitler's willing executioners. Yeah. Call them. Who do you remember the most? Well, there are so many things that I remember and I shared and I continue to share. Uh, I do not know from such a large groups of things that happened to me, the ones that were dear to, m to me, what I have seen in my life, what I have heard from other survivors that I have met in, uh, in my life. I'm very familiar with the life of the survivors from Memphis because I formed the Holocaust Memorial Committee here. And I consider that I did this because I want them to have a place where they should share and keep alive the memory of the Holocaust. We suffered a lot of persecution. We suffered a lot of humiliation, moral degradation. What to say? It's, it's so hard to find examples and examples of how horrible we were persecuted during, those, during, during the war. But finally, it came for me, August the 23rd, when I was liberated by the Russian. I could not believe <laughs> that. Tell me about that day. Well, we were at work in the camp, and uh, first came a tank and could not come to the to the camp because of the of, of the road. So, a, a Russian on a horse came and said in Yiddish, "Idni rzent fry." And I said, uh, "People could not understand what is he, he could not say only a few words. Idni rzent fry. Jews, you are free." And of course, immediately uh, we went to the tank and they start taking out chocolate and giving to people and people were eating. I said the result is going to be many are going to have diarrhea after eating this, after not eating for so many days. But we were happy, we were pleased, we went home. Uh, the radio start broadcasting songs. For instance, many times people are asking me why do I sing that my favorite song is The Four Seasons by Vivaldi? I was coming home and I was very, very without energy and I was making many stops. I didn't have any money to take the streetcar. So I was walking from the camp to home. Which was how far? Ah, not too far, two hours. Uh, to tell you a story that <laughs> I came home and my mother said, uh, very happy that he saw me. She said, what happened to your underwear that they are so green? I said, mother, we did not have toilet paper, so we used leaves. <laughs> and your 
You were gone how long in Bucharest? Two years almost. Mm-hmm. Two years. And your mother? Oh, I, I, I you. To a camp? No, mother, no. Father was sent to a camp for four years. To a labor survived? camp. In a, she sur- he survived, yes. Oh, I told right. your story, you told yes. 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 Yeah. Your mother was not sent to a camp? No. How no. did that happen? It happened because they did not have camps. You know, many people are asking, why did you survive? The, the simple answer is, Hitler did not have the transportation, the means to send them to Auschwitz, and did not have the means at Auschwitz to work faster. Do you know what happened in Wannsee when they had the conference Mm -hmm. to discuss the final solution? They said, it will take us years and years to exterminate all the Jewish population. And they made an appeal to the German intelligentsia, discover something to exterminate them faster. And that's how it comes, the Zyklone B bomb. Mm -hmm. When the Zyklone B bomb came, I mean, the chemical product the came, gas. the gas, they could exterminate from morning until night, Jews. If they would have had the means, I wouldn't have been here to talk to you. I probably would have ended up in one of the con- extermination camp. But lucky, they did not have the means, the war finished, and I'm here. What do you want people to know? Well, I want people to know I want people to know that's, that this tragedy could happen again. And we see in our days forms of genocide. The Holocaust is a form of genocide against the Jewish people. We were killed because we did not have blue eyes, blonde hair. We did not look like the pure Germans. And we have affected what Hitler considered the the purity of the German nation. So we want pure people like the Germans to exist. The same thing happened today, no? We have many forms of genocide. Take the Hutus and the in Zimbabwe, no? They killed each other. Take Saddam Hussein who, who killed his own people. And many, take what happened in in uh, Yugoslavia. Innocent people who were killed day by day and we discover in every day another mass, mass grave with people with, that were exterminated. How do we stop it? How do we stop it? We stop it only with the answer to your question. Remembering and not forgetting keeping alive the memory of the Holocaust, telling the story to the people, telling, making them aware. You know, when Elie Wiesel said that the Holocaust can instill caution and fortify restraint and prevent an, against other situ- similar situation, he was referring not just to the Holocaust, but what ha- can happen to the rest of the world in our days. That's why when I came to America, I said, I have to dedicate all my efforts to tell the story, to make those who suffer to tell their story. That's why we formed at Baron Hirsch a Holocaust Memorial Committee. That's why when I got the chance to meet Gore and Sanquist 20 years ago in Washington, I said to them, help me to build a Holocaust Committee in, Mem- in Tennessee. They did, and that's why we have today a Holocaust Committee in Tennessee. We are going to celebrate 20 years in uh, next year with God's help. And we have done many, many things. How do you think that it could have happened that a small village in Tennessee, like Paperclip Project, Paperclip Project no Jew is there. Not one Jew. No one Jew. But they tell the story. They educate the children. The German were impressed. They sent them a boxcar. This is the story in the small town of Tennessee children. This is the story of the Tennessee children. In Whitfield, in Whitfield, Tennessee, that collected six million six paper million paper clips. clips. Now they have a monument in Whitfield, Tennessee, not in Baron Hirsch or in Memphis or in Nashville, but in Whitfield, Tennessee. I sent them twenty-three paper clips. 
I send them a package. A pa doesn't matter. Import, important is that y you're, y you are willing to remember. And that's what they wanted to do. And that's what I wanted to do. And that's what you all wanted to do. And to work for the remembering of the Holocaust. Well, all of the work you've done, all the exposure, all the efforts. I have the Baron Hirsch Holocaust Memorial Committee, charter member and former president of the Jewish Historical Society in the Mid-South, vice president and member of the executive committee of the American Gathering of Jewish Holocaust Survivors. You have several congregations and are several committees that you're a member of. Are there still some very difficult nights for you? No, I have a great satisfaction. I sleep very easy during the night. I think that uh, I have uh, inspired, modestly to speak, many other people to do good things for the memory of the Holocaust. With me, from 20 years, I have seen great teachers, people from the entire country who comes to work for the, for to prepare uh, education for Holocaust, Holocaust education. We wrote books. We have outreach program. We have many, many positive things. And that's because people are aware that only by hard work we'll keep alive the memory of the Holocaust. So I think that we have done in Tennessee great things, great things. And I'm very proud of every achievement. Teachers, take teachers. Uh, you know, we have the Bell Slipman Award. By the way, I have formed, I have another award that I gave with Jack. This is Bell Slipman, but it's a Bell Saharovich Award that I give at Rhodes College to a student who exceeds in teaching the Holocaust. At Rhodes College, one of the best colleges in the United States, we teach Holocaust. That's a great pleasure for me. The fact that we have a waiting list for the 20 seats assigned every semester for this class. That's great. That's really makes proud all the Memphians. And that was possible because we created a good atmosphere to remembering the Holocaust. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Is there anything you'd like to add? I don't. I wanted to make it easier for you because no, I know that you are. Oh, I'm going to put this in my file because you I you you can use it because it, it, use it. it's use uh, it. it's going to help. But it has been a pleasure talking. And to you. And I want to thank you all who who are here. It's fantastic. It's great. If that's that's when we more people like you we're going to have in Tennessee better the story is going to be told. That's it.